scripture today. You're going to be stuck with me again. Because I forgot to give it to anybody else. <laughs> Exodus 1, 6 through 14. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Then, he, then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal, with shrewdly, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies. Fight against us and leave, leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work with them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go. I want to say a Negro spirit. Uh, I learned this, and I think, the, uh, about the third or fourth grade or something. I'm assuming that uh, you folks may be aware of it. What I'm going to do so that we can we can learn it, I'm going to sing a verse in the chorus, and then we're going to go in and uh, do it as a congregation, okay? Now, the difference is when we sing the verses in the chorus, what's in pink, the ladies sing, what's in blue, the men sing, and what's in white, all of us sing, okay? So, Lucy, if you have, Charlie, if you'll help me out here. His first course. <laughs>
his best to Joe's. How many of you do that? I, I learned it in grade school, I think it was. You didn't know it. Man, I figured you were there when they wrote it. <laughs> Charlie, I don't know what I'd do if I get a young piano player. Oh, my. Well, uh, today, this is Memorial Day weekend. It's a holiday. Uh, it's a time for rest. Uh, a time to honor those who uh, serve to uh, give us uh, our to give us our freedom, but most importantly, it's a time to remember and to recommit ourselves to the principles that these people fought and died for. Our declaration states this: We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This summer, I want to ask a question. Where did this concept of liberty or freedom originate? Where did it start? Um, if you think back about it, every war that America has fought has been about freedom and liberation. Now I know there are liars out there that will try to impugn our motives and say, oh, we were doing it for imperialism, or we were doing it for oil, or we were doing it for a lot of things. That's simply not true. It's simply not true. We did it to free people. We did it to protect our own freedom. And the question becomes, why are we so passionate about this? Why are, you, you talked about Americans, and they are passionate about freedom. Uh, it, it runs through everything that that we uh, that we do so where did this story begin and the answer is it began in the bible let me go back and point out to you that the framers of the declaration of independence were not atheists they were god fearing people and they made a bold statement, wrote it down on paper that's continued for this entire time that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now self-evident means that uh, if you've got enough sense to stay out of the creek, you can, you can figure this out. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, Whoa! Think about your world history just a little bit. There was always the ruling class, and there was the uh, small uh, working class, and there was the slave class. And, you and they're saying, wait a minute! All men are created equal. It's self-evident. And that they were endowed by their government? No. They were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What do you mean unalienable? You can't get rid of them. They are there. They stay. There are certain unalienable rights And they are, three of them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Okay? They said that was self-evident. Okay? And it came, it starts with the story. Now, this summer, I'm going to do a, a series on the stories that gave us our theology. Okay? Um, and when we start talking about freedom, freedom begins with the story of the children of Israel and the Exodus. Let's talk, let's, let's do the story. It's familiar to most of us, but, uh, but it's good to remind ourselves. First of all, God created a covenant with a man called Abraham. Now, the reason why God did this is because Abraham believed God. God said some things and he did. And what he did, he made a covenant with him and he promised him three things. He promised him land, which we would know today as the land of Israel. They called it the promised land. It was Canaan. It was whatever. Uh, they promised him land. Promised them posterity. Now that may seem to us, uh, you know, having children and kids after it may seem something. But you have to remember that for Abraham, he was childless. And he was a hundred and he was, his wife was 90 before their first legitimate heir was born. And so the promise of posterity and something that, that would become big and the kings would come out of them, huge, huge promise. But finally, the biggest <laughs> promise was that the whole human race would be blessed through his austerity. Now, we're standing the other side of, of uh, Christmas, and we know that, that the way the whole humanity was blessed was uh, a couple of things. First of all, we were given the Word of God through them, but it was Jesus Christ that blessed us. But that was a covenant that he made with them. Well. Let's fast forward. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had the covenant. And uh, as it turns out, uh, oh, uh, Jacob had 12 sons. Uh, his uh, 11 sons did not like uh, Joseph. And so when they were out in the fields, Joseph was sold into slavery and sent down to Egypt. Now, that seemed like a very bad thing, but what is what is not obvious at this point in the story is, is that God is sending Joseph down to prepare a place so that the whole family could be protected. He goes into Egyptian slavery. Uh, he spends some time uh, working for Potiphar. The house is blessed. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. He refuses, and so she grabs his coat and screams rape, and he gets thrown into prison. Now, being in prison uh, was tough, especially for a kid. The reason why his brothers hated him is because he had this dream that uh, it was symbolic. They had, there were 12 sheaves, and those 11 sheaves would bow down to him. They didn't like his idea of being submissive to him, whatever, whatever. So they sold him off. And so now here we are in prison on false charges, sent away by jealous brothers, and it looks like anything is going to happen, uh, it could, could possibly happen. But through a series of events, uh, Joseph rises to become prime minister. Uh, there's a seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. Uh, he uh, helped prepare the Egyptians for the seven years of famine. And at some point during that time, uh, his family ran out of food. Uh, they came down to Egypt. Uh, through a series of events, Joseph eventually reveals who he is to his brothers after they had bowed down to him. And uh, they sent for their father, and they all moved back, and they moved to Egypt, and they were in the land of Goshen. Okay, that's where they lived. And they prospered there. They went down a clan of 80 people, but as you picked up in our scripture, they multiplied. Uh, better than rabbits, I guess, is the better way. <laughs> but they multiplied and filled the whole land. Uh, not a problem until a king, another pharaoh, <coughs> arises. The whole 
generation dies, Joseph dies, and another Pharaoh comes up who didn't know Joseph, didn't know Joseph's story, and did not uh, uh, appreciate what had come on. And so he said, we've got to do something to slow these people down. And so what he did, he put slave masters over the people and put them into very hard labor. Uh, the scripture says they worked in brick and mortar, that they built the, uh, the cities of Python and Ramses. We have remnants of, the archaeologists have uncovered um, oh, uh, the ruins of those cities in Egypt. And they were built by the Hebrew people who made the bricks and carried the bricks and built the bricks and the stones that were there. They were very cruel in what they did. And their, their labor was bitter. And they began to cry out to God for freedom. Well, uh, this goes on for some time. And finally, uh, because that when they tried to do the uh, hard labor thing, they just multiplied more. Uh, <clears throat> the Pharaoh said, I want you to throw all the baby boys into the Nile. Well, uh, as any mother would be, uh, Moses' mother could not stand to have her baby thrown into the Nile and killed. She made a basket, uh, put him in the Nile, and as God's providence would have it, uh, he, she, he, she was in the reeds. Pharaoh's daughter discovers, the baby says, oh, this is one of the Hebrew babies. Now his sister was watching from a distance and she says, I'm going to take this in to be my son. And so the uh, Moses' sister, <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter doesn't realize that it is his sister. She comes up and says, well, would you like me to get a nurse? He said, yes, I would. And so she goes and gets Moses' mom. They go into the palace, and she is uh, his, his wet nurse. Moses is raised in the palace as one of royalty. He is trained in government. He is to take his place among them. God is preparing. Well, he was there for 40 years, and he began to realize who he really was. Reminds me of the, uh, the uh, one of my favorite lines, one of my favorite movies, The Lion King, where Simba is saying to his father, but you don't know what I've become. And he says, remember who you are. And what happens, Moses remembers who he is. Well, uh, and he begins to try and work with the the uh, Israelite people so that they would see that he is to be their, deli their deliverer. But and one day, one of the slave drivers was abusing one of the Israelites. And he went and, and killed the guy. Well, it just so happens word got out. They were out to try and get him. And so he runs away to the land of Midian. While he is there, he comes into contact with... Uh, uh, Jethro's daughters there at a, at a uh, well trying to feed their sheep. Some bullies are trying to warn in on them. Moses clears the deck for them, feeds their sheep, and he ends up marrying a girl. Uh, he spends another 40 years in many herding sheep. Hardly a deliverer. Now in the meantime, God's people are crying to him and crying for deliverance. And one day, out on the, uh, when he was out taking uh, care of the sheep, he noticed a bush that isn't, that, that's burning, but it's not consumed. And so he goes over to take a look at it. And when he gets there, a voice speaks and says, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And in that conversation, God calls Moses and tells him to go back and to be deliver his people and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Moses, of course, does that. One of the tricks he has, one of the things that God gave him, is that if he would throw down his rod, uh, 
uh, it would become a snake. Well, Pharaoh's magicians thought that they would do that too. They had their tricks and they laid, threw down their rod and they became snakes. Moses' snake ate up all theirs. Picks it up by the tail and it becomes a, a rod again. Well, we know the story that Pharaoh hardens his heart and through a series of ten different plagues, uh, uh, his heart becomes more and more hard. He refuses to let people go until we get to the last plague, which is the death of every firstborn in every family throughout Egypt, at which point Pharaoh drives the people uh, from, from Israel, from Egypt. They come, as after they've wowed and after they leave Egypt, Pharaoh has a change of heart. He decides he's going to slaughter them. He sends an army behind them. They come to the Red Sea. Uh, they have an army behind them. They have the Red Sea in front of them. And God sends a pillar of fire uh, by night. It's a cloud by day between them and the army so the army can't get it. He opens the Red Sea. And the people walk through on dry ground, get to the other side. When the uh, Egyptians tried to do it, uh, the sea closes in and drowns the entire army that was coming after them. From there, they went to a place uh, uh, called Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, God made a covenant with that people. And this is where the clan became a nation. And he gave them the covenant of the Ten Commandments. And that they are to be a free people. And that they will live free by abiding by these Ten Commandments. He promises he will bless them. He promises they will, he will protect them. He promises that they will be his people as long as they obey those ten commands. Now I want you to think about something here. What does this story tell us? First of all, when you begin to see this, all the oppression, everything is going on. If you think about it, you begin to realize God created humanity to be free. They are to have the right of self-determination. They are to have the right to go where they want, to do what they want, to work as they want. That becomes the basis of that exodus and God's miraculous freeing of these people screams to humanity. <coughs> now I can't help but stop here and make a point about the distinction between Christianity and Islam. Islam tries to, to tell us that they worship the same God as Abraham. There's a problem with Islam. Because in Islam, people are not free. They are to live under a caliphate. That's Arabic for a tyrant. And Sharia law is what is to be there. And first of all, it is a very harsh law. But second of all, if you refuse to accept the tyrant and the law, you're killed. The problem with Islam is that it has never been about freedom. It's only in the Judeo-Christian ethic that we get this story of freedom and that people are supposed to be there. I remember 
when George Bush went into Iran. And again, his goals were laudable. We wanted to free these people from this evil tyrant. But I told people in my Bible study the night he went in, I said it'll never work. And it didn't. I said the reason why is those people only know dictatorships, the caliphate. And sure enough, while the people were glad to be free of Saddam Hussein, the only reason they wanted to be free of Saddam Hussein is that they could come in and do the very same corrupt things he did. And today, we are back, maybe not as brutal a regime, but the people are free. You see, it does make a difference. And our stories determine our theology. And one of our foundation stories is, God said, let my people go. And he screams that at dictators all across this world. Let my people be free. God spoke to humanity to be free. However, I ended with Moses getting the Ten Commandments for a very important reason. Liberty is not license. Now, there are those among us that think that freedom is the right to do whatever we want to do, however we please, without any thought towards the consequences of who and how it might live. I grew up in that generation. I was part of the, I'm a baby boomer. I was in college when Woodstock happened. I'm not proud of that. As far as I'm concerned, my generation stooped to the level of pigs where they were wallowing in the mud and fornicating. Oh, but we're a free people. Oh, is that what freedom means? No. Freedom has to do with what the scripture calls the perfect law of freedom. You see, you're free within certain boundaries. There's a reason why God said, thou shalt not see. There's a reason why God said, do not commit adultery. There's a reason why God said, honor your father and your mother. Those boundaries allow us to have a real choice and to really be free. Liberty is not license. However, this story underscores something, and that is freedom must be fought for. Because there is always those who would impose their will on others. I've done a lot of thinking for the last several years about what's going on in our country. There is an element within our country that is doing its best to take away our freedoms. We have a Bill of Rights. That, those ten amendments to the United States Constitution guarantee us certain freedoms. <clears throat> One of the things in the Bill of Rights, First Amendment says, Congress shall make no laws uh, regarding a religion. Okay? We are to have freedom of conscience. I cannot, I am not supposed to be compelled to do something if it violates my conscience. Correct? Is this not what we have agreed on First Amendment for a long time? 
But today, in our nation, the LGBT community is forcing business owners to do things that violate their conscience. There's a baker in Kansas. There's a florist in Michigan who, when they came to the gays came to them and asked them to serve them uh, at their wedding, they were kind, they were generous, but they simply said, my conscience will not let me do this. The authorities have all but driven those people out of business. Freedom of religion? Freedom of speech? Oh, it's always, uh, it's in the news all over the place. We're supposed to have freedom of speech, right? What happened when Mike Pence tried to deliver his address at the college? What happened to Ann Coulter? Now, you may or may not agree with them. That's the whole point of free speech, is that whether or not we agree, we are to respect the right to say it. Now, one of the arguers in the Constitution Convention uh, after someone had stood up and made a, uh, a speech about something, I believe it was Patrick Henry stood up and said, Sir, I disagree with you completely, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it. I put on a uniform to guarantee that. Proud of. Do it again. Can you see? Just look at what's happening. For crying out loud, we're coming to the point that, that they're trying to take our freedom to eat what we want away. If you go to New York City, you cannot buy a Coke at McDonald's of any bigger size than 16 ounces. Because the powers have to be, have decided that it's bad for your health. <laughs> Let me see. Declaration of Independence. You have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if a 32-ounce Coke makes me happy, I ought to be able to get it. <laughs> but it can kill you, Pastor John. That's my problem, not yours. Yeah. We're beginning to see there is this tremendous internal assault on our freedoms. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it's beginning to turn violent on the other side. I simply say that on this Memorial Day, it is time for us to think again about freedom. To realize why there are the, those who lay in Flanders' field. There is a reason why there are graves in Arlington Cemetery. There is a reason why tomb of an unknown soldier. And the answer is freedom is a God-given right. However, freedom is not free. <clears throat> freedom is not free. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we've done our best to declare your word. Father, first of all, we want to stop and thank you for freedom. Thank you for what you've done for us. As we come before you, we've 
pray for our nation. Father, we're asking in this struggle for freedom. Lord, we ask that we not abuse our rights. Father, we also ask that those who would be over us not take away our freedoms. Now, Lord, as we come before you, we ask that we would be people of the book. Father, even as there is a conflict of ideas, we ask that in this conflict of ideas, we would have respect for one another, whatever our particular position may be. Father, we ask that the, the love of God would underpin everything we do. Father, we pray for those who may disagree with us. Lord, we're asking that instead of shouting at one another, will you help us to have respectful dialogue that we may understand one another? Because you promised that if we would know the truth, the truth would make us free. Lord, as human beings, we know we have limited understanding. Father, there are understandings from those on the other side that we need to hear. Father, bless us. Above all, we ask that you would bless America. Amen. <coughs> Let us stand. I'd like to close by singing God Bless America. <laughs>